I want to welcome you all to this event, Unearthing Solidarity, Global Voices on Mining Justice. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here and particularly pleased to have our panelists and moderator with us tonight. I would invite us now to consider the territory that we are on. And perhaps you will listen first, and then we can invite you to add to it afterwards. We'll do a territorial acknowledgement and then an opening prayer. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We thank each group, each individual for allowing us to meet and learn on together on their territories. I acknowledge that I am on the territory of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. I am on these territories of the Huron-Wendat, Patoon, Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous Peoples. This here in Toronto has also been a gathering place for Métis, Inuit, and many other First Nations peoples, historically and presently. We honor all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island. We honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it, for all those here today, and for the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we can hear them, an infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home. The unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of all this land. As we acknowledge the first caretakers of this land, I also situate myself in the Don Valley watershed, shared with a vast array of creatures and elements. And I ask you to join me in prayer. Creator God, I give thanks for each of the speakers that will share their wisdom and their stories with us today. I give thanks for each listener who will open their hearts and minds to new information, new thoughts, new motivation and energy. I thank you for the passion in this room, the passion for justice, and pray that your spirit will enliven that passion, that we will continue to work for the greater good of all. Creator God, we ask your guidance and your blessing on our time together. Amen. Once again, welcome to everyone. And I invite you now, if uh, you want to offer a territorial acknowledgement or an introduction, you could do so in the chat. I want to introduce you to the moderator for our panel today. Joan Kuyak is a lifelong champion for communities affected by mining and author of Unearthing Justice, How to Protect Your Community from the Mining Industry. And I wanna tell you uh, a little bit about this book. It has been translated into uh, three languages with an additional edition. Um, with a particular forward for an African edition. 
three of us um, from three different organizations, myself from Kairos, Dean Detloff from Development and Peace, and Johannes Chan from the Student Christian Movement work together to bring about a reading group this winter, um, beginning in January. And we chose this book, um, Unearthing Justice, and read uh, several chapters of it through January with a group of students um, meeting on the U of T campus, students and young adults and uh, who were interested in mining justice. And so that uh, forms the basis of our conversation today and how we came to be inviting these particular people to speak to you today. And so with that, I want to tell you a little bit more of Joan's history before I uh, turn it over to her. Joan was the founding national coordinator of Mind and Watch Canada. She worked there from 1999 to 2009, and she continues to do work for Mining Watch and many communities. Her advocacy, organizing, and research have been indispensable for all of us seeking mining justice in Canada. And Joan has long been a friend to both Kairos and Development and Peace and worked together in many campaigns. So welcome, Joan. And uh, we look forward to your guiding us through this panel this evening. Thank you very much, Shanna, and welcome everybody to the webinar. This evening, you're going to be hearing from three courageous and learned people about the impacts of mining in Brazil and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and in Canada. And we will be reflecting on the role that the Canadian government and our provincial governments are playing in these impacts. When I was writing Unearthing Justice, I clarified my analysis a little bit about the Canadian mining industry, and I came to understand a few important things. Basically, mining is at the forefront of the colonial assault on Indigenous peoples. It is in Canada and it exports these lessons in colonialism around the world. Mining is a waste management industry. It has a short-term benefits and very long-term consequences. The mining industry controls the discourse about it, shapes government law, regulation, and policy, and pays little tax relative to its earnings. The true costs of mining are externalized to communities, the ecosystem, and to the workers themselves. Mining cannot exist without enormous government subsidy. And we can put mining in its proper place by supporting affected communities, understanding and debunking the myths that the industry propagates, and by organizing efforts to change Canadian law and policy. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Father Dario Bossi is a naturalized Brazilian Camboni missionary. He has just finished a six year service as provincial coordinator of his congregation in Brazil. Previously, he studied and worked for four years on the outskirts of the huge city of Sao Paulo. I think it's the fourth largest city in the world, with a particular dedication to defending the rights of children and adolescents. And before that, he spent 10 years in Mariano State in the northeast of Brazil. In one of the communities there, which I'm going to mispronounce, I'm sure, Paquia Acalandia, where he was a parish priest, he took up the cause of the communities affected by the binding and steel cycle. Specifically, the communities were suffering because of the Grande Carajas project, the largest iron ore mine in the world, owned by the company Vale. South Valley. Valley is, by the way, in Sudbury. He became the coordinator of Justicia Nos Trilhos Network, a network of affected communities along the Carajas Corridor, from where the ore is extracted and exported from the heart of the Amazon. He is also Latin American Ecumenical Network of, he is also with the Latin American Ecumenical Network of Churches and Mining, and an advisor to the Pan Amazonial Ecclesial Network. Welcome, Father Dario. Thank you, Joan. What a good 
presentation too much for me. And thank you to the organizers of the, this very important meeting. Sorry for my English. At the beginning, I have to ask patience because my English is very little, but I, can, I could try. I prepared a, a PowerPoint to, uh, to help myself and also some written things to, to go through my presentation. Um, I am very happy to stay here with you and we believe very much on the importance of uh, interconnection and network uh, among countries. So let me, allow me to share uh, the PowerPoint. Let me see if it is functioning. Is it okay? Okay, so um, we, I'd like to start to present our uh, uh, reality um, in three uh, steps. The first one is uh, uh, talking to you about some conflict situation we, we are facing in Brazil. The second step is to share how we feel, not just we, we know, we, we recognize, but we feel in our hearts, in our bodies, the resistance of the communities. And the third step uh, is to talk with you uh, about which kind of support we, could we would like to receive and to interchange between Brazil, other countries, obvious, obviously, and uh, Canada. So regarding the first step, the conflict situation, I would like to talk to you, for example, about our friends, the indigenous Yanomami, with very much respect, the same respect you started with in this very uh, strong prayer you made. We have to enter really with, uh, with our, in, in this sacred world of the indigenous and in the special uh, case of the Yanomami people, we, as the photo, as the images present us, we are really uh, facing a passion situation. Uh, this comparison between this uh, living but very suffering body of a, a Yanomami indigenous person and the body of Christ in a very strong Russian picture. It's very strong, the similarity. Uh, the Yanomami leaders are weakened because of hunger. In the last years, 570 children at least died because of hunger in their land. Uh, in a land marked by malaria, the lack of medical assistance and the contamination of their territories. You can imagine in their territory, we have almost 30,000 of Yanomami indigenous people. And uh, in this moment, we have 20,000 illegal gold miners inside their land. Uh, and they are the very responsible for the degeneration of the territory. We can conclude that in the Amazon forest, uh, mining has reached its limits and uh, it, it's seeking to invade uh, more and more frontiers, sacred territories um, uh, that we just have to protect. A second story I can try, I can present is about a Canadian company, Kinross. Brazil is the fifth country with the highest investments from Canadian mining companies. And uh, a report by uh, the Canadian NGO Above Ground denounced uh, direct impacts on, uh, of King Ross in uh, Minas Gerais state in Brazil on uh, Afro communities, water contamination with arsenic, threats received by the local leaders and a, a large consumption of water by companies. And uh, also the, the tailing dams at Paracatu, the, the place where the, the company is, is installed, are vulnerable to fear. It is a, a gold mine. Generally, we consider gold as a noble metal, but uh, we can state that uh, its extraction in the most of the cases is full of violence. The third case is from my land, where I lived, as Joan was explaining for 10 years, uh, Pitya, but you pronounce it quite well, Joan. Um, uh, Pitya um, is a region where we have the largest 
open pit iron mine in the world. And it is very inside the Amazon forest, in the uh, eastern part of the Brazilian Amazon forest. Um, and beside the, 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 the mine, we have all the iron ore transport system. Uh, because they extract the, 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 the iron ore and they export it to China, to Europe. Uh, and, um, and this iron ore transport system, which is a, a long, uh, 900 kilometers long, it's a railroad passing uh, through uh, something like 100 communities, uh, indigenous people, Afro, Afro descendant, descendants, um, farmers, uh, very simple people, cities uh, crossed by this uh, railroad. And uh, the impacts of, in this case, are deforestation, pollution, accidents caused by the train that crosses. So we can say and conclude in the case of Tikia that mining not just marks uh, the place where the, 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 the ore is taken out, the hole, let us say, but is marking entire regions and condemns their economies to mine independence. The fourth, the fourth and last case I will present to you is the case of Brumaginho. Probably you heard about it because it's the worst uh, situation we had to face in, in 2019. Uh, it is a case of a mining waste dump collapse uh, that killed 2,072 persons and contaminated an, an entire river basin. It happened just four years after another very similar crime that the same company, Valle in Mariana, not so much, not so far from, from Dumaji, provocated. There, there we had 19 vests and another river basin contaminated up to the sea. And nothing has been learned between one case and the following one. On the contrary, it was known that Brumaginius Dam was dangerous, but they didn't make anything to prevent the accident. Valle preferred to take the risk. The lesson we understand and the question we, we raise is how much are lives worth? If it is convenient, the company preferred to continue their business, taking any kind of risk. And, and calculating how much at, 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 uh, at, uh, if it was the case, they will have to pay. Let us follow for a minute in silence, in a silent respect for the victims, the scene of this criminal collapse. So uh, where do people find the strength to uh, face this uh, level of conflicts and this, uh, this proportion of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the enemy they have to, to combat? Uh, first of all, I would say 
uh, from uh, memory and celebration. Uh, it is very important for us. And we find that spirituality is the root, the root of resistance. And it is a, a bond between the people and their territory, territories. For example, in Brumaginio, every year on the 15th of January, the anniversary of this crime, uh, we celebrate the pilgrimage of integral ecology. And every month uh, of every year on the 15th day, a memory of the victims is held. And it is impressive, the local people's strength despite the humiliation they suffer. Another uh, example of resistance is the popular mobilization. This is from uh, this photo and this story is from my uh, territory, Pikia. There, the community is claiming for integral reparation for the suffered violation of pollution and conflict by, of the railway for over 15 years. And now, they are achieving a collective resettlement in a region far from pollution, without uh, the company's influence corrupting the community collective organization. In most of the cases, uh, it's interesting how the companies try to enter, to divide, and to uh, seduce uh, uh, leaders of the communities uh, to, to weaken their uh, organizational resistance. But in this case, even if we have our failures and our weaknesses, um, we, we could uh, avoid this kind of, uh, of influence and we could maintain the community sufficiently uh, united to, to, um, to achieve their, their, their dream. Uh, still, they, did, they haven't um, uh, resettled themselves, but we have uh, reached something like this 65% of the construction of the new, of the new uh, city, let us say. The third example of resistance is uh, the international alliance. That's why uh, I'm very glad to stay here, to have to know Joan and to have this collaboration with the organization that, organize, that prepared this, this uh, meeting. Uh, in the case, uh, one of the, of the examples of uh, international alliance is investigations. For example, popular movements are increasingly investigating the chain of products extracted from some lands to others. We try to show how the gold, copper, the iron ore used in the global north and uh, the products sold there often carry the blood of peoples or the ashes of the amazing. Uh, what to say about the support from Canada? The first uh, support we are asking to you, obviously, is solidarity. And we are very, very excited in seeing so many persons in, interested uh, in, uh, in this kind of, of discussion. Uh, water and life are worth more than gold. So what we are uh, needing is sensitivity, denunciation, uh, people echoing the community's cry. We, we, we uh, understand the importance of meetings like this. Uh, we understand the importance of you all keeping connected to development and peace, to Kairos, to the students' Christian movement, uh, this kind of uh, alliance uh, going on, not just uh, uh, reduced to, to a, a webinar, but uh, a kind of commitment continue. The second uh, possibility of uh, alliance is dispelling the myth of mining. Uh, because it's very easy to, to fall down into the company's narratives. For sure, they have many money to, to make propaganda and to, 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 to pin, uh, to, to design their narrative in order that people uh, believe them. But please don't fall into their, their myths. For example, this kind of rhythm of mining is unsustainable. We can't uh, at all explain it and tolerate. This kind of economy is killing. I'm, it's not me who is saying it, but also Pope Francis. This economy kills. This kind of economy, this kind of mining, does not generate development 
or at least develops just uh, only 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 a, a very few group, little group of people. So the very the very important path is to support the self determination of communities to encourage their ways of life and their kind of local economies. The third uh, perspective of collaboration is uh, about laws, as Joan was already saying in her introduction. For example, the due diligence. Uh, laws in the global north that oblige companies to track the entire production chain. Laws that make big companies responsible for the partners they, they choose from the beginning up to the end of the chain. And also, for example, the binding treaty for companies and human rights. Um, the fourth and last uh, collaboration is, uh, one, is, is an initiative of our uh, churches and mining network, uh, which is the divestment campaign. We try to show the connection among, among the mining companies that cause violation, the banks and investment funds, and our money. And uh, it is a church campaign, so we try to stimulate and to invite uh, the churches, the religious groups, the dioceses, uh, uh, to, to give the first example of, of this movement of divestment. Because generally they are supposed to be as one of the ethical references in the society. So they have, if, if, even if they don't have so much money, but their uh, movement could be, uh, could provocate a, a thinking, a reflection to withdraw money from these funds that are feeding uh, the deaths and the accidents and the nature uh, destroying. Okay, so thanks for your attention. I hope that you understood me and uh, I will be avail available for diary. Thank you so much, Father Dario. That was really, really interesting and helpful and very moving. Our second speaker is going to be Loretta Williams. Um, from the Chilcotin Nation in uh, British Columbia. Um, I've, she's a proud member of the Hennigan, one of the Chilcotin communities. And uh, she has been a mining advisor, a mining coordinator for that First Nation. And she was one of the founders of First Nations Women Advocating for Responsible Mining, which took on mining all across British Columbia. Um, we're very proud to have Loretta here today, and she'll bring home to us, I'm quite sure, how these kinds of issues happen also in Canada. And it's what these companies have learned to do in Canada, this being exported and used abroad. Loretta. Thank you very much, Joan. We've shared a lot of space together, and, you know, it's still... We're still doing the same thing, still the same battles as back when. Um, again, my name is Loretta Williams. I'm coming from you on the unceded territory of the Shishkwatam. Um, I, live, I live here in Williams Lake um, and um, outside of my community. Um, my community is 200 kilometers away from where I live right now. Um, but I have a long story to tell, lots of stories, and I'll just hit on a few important topics. Um, I'm from the Tzaiskot'in Nation. Um, my community is the Hanikot'in, and um, I was raised by my grandparents since a very young age, as I could remember, and, and um, within their teachings and within my aunts, aunts and uncles' teachings and and my, um, my grandparents, my parents, you know, everyone around me, we were taught to be very like, you know, respect our land, you know, because our land looks after us. Um, you know, I come from an area where the waters are clean. You can drink from the rivers. You can drink right out of the rivers. And, and you know, there's, we haven't been, there's no logging in our territory, no mining. Um, and, um, and it's because you know we've protected we've protected it and our our grandparents before us and and our children will continue on after us um so yeah we've been taught to respect everything the land you know like you know if you're going to go camping you leave the area cleaner than you 
than you uh, that when you first got there. Um, you leave a small footprint in anything you do, whether it be hunting, fishing, berry picking, you know, you don't overuse, you don't overtake. Um, if you're going to use one area one year, you don't use it the next year, you find another area to, to fish or hunt or, or berry pick or, or gather your medicines. Um, very traditional. I um, was raised by my grandparents who were fluent in, in um, their language, which is the Chilcotin language. And, and um, my, my grandmother never smoke, spoke a, a word of English. You know, she was um, all um, English was never important to her. <laughs> she would never, um, never speak it. And, and but my grandparent, my grandfather was very fluent um, with the language. So that was, that's how I was able to learn um, a lot of what he had to teach. I understood the langu language very well but I could not speak it. Um, I imagine I did in my younger days, but um, we've been through so much trauma that, you know, through residential school system um, where our children were taken from us um, or we were taken from our parents and put into homes. And um, it was a very traumatic experience and the many of us have lost our language since, but um, we have a high number, very high, probably the highest number in our territories um, that still speak the Chilcotin language. Um, so yeah, I come from an area that is um, is very pristine. Um, and we have the backdrop of the coastal um, mountains and um, snow-capped mountains, clean waters, wild horses, and, um, and a very proud people, you know. We're very, very proud. We're very, very respectful. And, um, you know, we're, we're very nice people. You know, if you ever came to my territory, you would be invited in for tea, or coffee, and bannock. Oh my gosh, they would make you bannock on the spot. You know, we're just very kind, gentle people. And, um, and when Tosico, like Tosico Mines Limited came to our territory, I was, uh, I was a young mother back then and, and uh, I was a natural resource worker and, and I had attended one environmental assessment um, workshop. It was a, a week long and I did not even know after that, that workshop, what exactly it meant. And then I, and I heard within the meeting that like, they told me like uh, that there was a mining company interested. They had been doing exploration in our territory. And I didn't even know about that. I was just, I was just really green to everything about mining. And, um, but they, I heard that, you know, they're, they're wanting to construct a mine. I was like, what? I was like, what? And, but anyway, I went home and I started asking around and they're like, yeah. And then shortly after that, Tosico Mines Limited came to our nation promising prosperity. And funny enough, that's what they that's what they named their project as well, their first project, the Prosperity Project. But they came into uh, um, our territory and um, they asked our chiefs if we wanted to um, to join them in investigating what this mine could be um, for our territory and for our people. And so we didn't really think we had a choice. You know, we didn't feel we had a choice whether um, we could just say no right there or if we had to go with the process. And so um, we thought about it, you know, we sent them away and we thought about it and we talked to our lawyers and our lawyers said, you know, you, you have to, you probably should get involved because at this point um, you don't know what that mine means for your territory. If you wanted to fight them, you wouldn't know, but we're like, we know what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's right there, it's plain and simple. They're right, right above the river they'll impact that whole territory. Did you see that map of the mine that they're going to create? We know what it's going to do already. We know what it's going to do to our people. And, but still we were, we were forced, you know, to go into this process that wasn't ours, you know? And so here we go. We, um, we uh, create this, um, this agreement with the mine to go ahead and um, see what this mine could mean to our people in our territory, you know, like get to know the impact, get to know the possible benefits. Maybe it would, maybe it would benefit us, who knows, but we had to investigate anything to do our, our due diligence as a people. 
And so here we go, and this is like 2004, and we went into, um, so this, the mine that they're proposing was um, a huge open pit mine. Um, they were after the gold and the copper within that area. And it was in most of the, the most of, or the most of the deposit was right underneath one of the, a lake, um, fish lake. And, um, and like I said, it was like, it was proposed right above um, a river in our territory that, um, that always had returning Chinook salmon and um, a, an area that was very high. And um, we knew that there was a lot of underground water systems through there. And very valuable ecosystem, you know, it was, um, it's home to the grizzly bear, um, a very historical site. Um, it was like, um, it tra trails used to go through there um, years ago when people used to pass through the travel from one area to another, very rich in stories. And we knew these stories, but they were sleeping. Their the stories were sleeping. We never, we never talked about them for a while. And, um, and so we did this, okay, we're like, okay, so we, 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 um, we started this process and it was to collect base, baseline data, um, you know, to see um, how, see what the land was like right now. So check, we had to, we did studies on the birds and, and um, the water, reptiles, um, the four legged air quality, you name it, um, underground water. And um, we went through all that in a neutral way, you know, like we, we wanted to collect this information, you know, and also like how the, how the mine would impact our people, the social impact study. And so um, here we go. We just, we dived right into it and it took us years. I ended up being, I ended up being that person who coordinated this whole thing. It was ginormous. It was huge amount of work. We had to hire um, people from our community to help with each one of those studies. We had to hire the experts and we made sure we told the mining company that we're not going to accept what they, what their studies were. We wanted to do all of the hiring of, of the experts that we knew of that we trusted and they let us do it, you know? And um, so we did, and, you know, we did our archeology span study and in that, that area was so rich. Like there was grave sites there. There was, um, we found an old, um, an old pipe um, within the area. And it was, it was from our, one of our medicine people. Our medicine people used to gather in that area and that's where they went to go get their strength, their, their spirit, their power to be medicine people. So it was very rich in culture and everything. Like, you know, we were very connected to the area and the lake, oh my gosh, it was such a, it is still, an awesome um, producing, like trout producing lake. Um, very beautiful, you know, it, it had the backdrop, like I said, of the coastal mountains, just beautiful, beautiful, clean waters, air, everything. Um, so, you know, we did the whole studies and I, and I kept walking into the room and presenting to our people, this is okay, this is what we learned today. And they're like, okay, Loretta, like, you know, we're pretty much done listening to all of this, you know, and, and listening to, to Seiko come in and tell us a story on, on the mine, um, on their project. And our people knew that that mine, that mining comp or that mine would, um, would impact us. And so we full out opposed it to Seiko Mines Limited, got very angry and they went away but still we are still in the environmental assessment process and we went through that process we actually went through two environmental assessments the new prosperity the prosperity project and the new prosperity project we had hearings in our communities where our people told stories how they were connected to the land and they basically begged the the government not to destroy it we had children tell them like, you know, this area is very important to us and we do not want it wrecked. And, um, but we opposed it and, and, you know, we came out on the other side, luckily twice, we had two um, oppositions, like the government opposed that project twice. And we were very lucky. We were one of the lucky ones, you know, because we watched other, um, other nations near us and we made friends all over the place through this process and we saw them um we saw the government approve mines in their in their territories which was really heartbreaking for us um and that's how we um 
First Nations Women Advocating for Responsible Mining was, was created and, and I was one of the founders. And we used that table to be able to support each other. Like it was a group of women who had very loud voices at, at these mining meetings. And we were very outspoken on how those mine companies and how their projects were going to impact our people. So we, um, we grouped together. There was probably about 12 of us, 20 of us. And, you know, um, we helped each other get through this workload, this unknown, whatever gigantic giant that was coming into our territories. We supported each other. We cried together. And, um, FN Warm, you know, um, got us through many hardships and was always there to support because we had our experts and then we had our we had our experts of the First Nations people who had been through this before us. And and then and then we also won title of our territory, the Honey Good Inn, on um, June 26th of 2014. We won title of our land, but it didn't include that area where the mine was going to be, where, where it was being proposed, you know. It was just outside of, um, we won, like we won area where we, we own it lock, stock and barrel, but we, it was just outside of the tidal area. So we couldn't fight it in that way. We still had to use our words and, you know, we went through it and, and during that time, you know, like we saw the destruction of the lands very close to us, Mount Polly mine breach happened August 14, August 4th of 2014 and where, um, Billions, millions, millions of cubic um, meters of water and waste tailings went down into a lake. And, you know, like I, when I saw that, I, I saw that my, um, my worst nightmare had come true. One of the mines had breached and was in, in the water system. It was in a lake and it was coming down the river where our salmon were spawning at that time. It was the morning that happened was the exact same morning that we were supposed to go down to the river and fish for salmon but we were scared too. We were looking at the river and we were scared. We were like, is this going to hurt us? Like, how is it down here yet? You know, it was just so unknown. And many of us never did um, fish that river for, for years afterwards because we were just, there was just not enough. We didn't have enough trust in their studies saying that, oh, it's okay, you know. And to this date, like that, um, the Mount Polly mine is still um, draining effluent into that, into that water system, into the Quinell Lake, which is heartbreaking for us and as First Nations people. So it's just, today, Tosico Mines Limited is still wanting to build the mine in our territory, even though like we have a full out opposed opposition to it. They bought up all of the exploration um, leases around, in around like where they wanted to um, create that mine. We're still battling them to this day, which is just so unfortunate and, so many stories to tell you and it felt like I had to rattle that one out but um but my time is up so I just really would like to thank um thank everyone thank Joan for inviting me here and um always done in sol sol solidarity with the people that are battling these lines you know so, it's so heartbreaking so thank you well thank you Loretta for telling your story it is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and that mining company just never goes away. Um, and I, it's, it's just something we're all facing and we're all struggling with. But you did win but in those cases, which was, I know it took everything you had for it and I really appreciate it. Our next speaker is Father Jacques Nzumbu who is a Jesuit, a Congolese, and a specialist in conflict minerals, responsible mineral supply chain due diligence, corporate social responsibility for mining companies, artisanal mining and strategic minerals and energy transition. His expertise also extends to renewable energy technology, especially in the areas of energy storage and transition technologies. He holds several master's degrees in governance and public policy of natural resources, in international affairs, economics, politics, and business law, and Ignatian leadership. He's currently a PhD student at the University of Quebec in Montreal, and recently completed the Green Justice Speaking Tour for the colleagues who put this event together tonight. Um, 
I know that he's also a passionate advocate for the people of his, his home country, and I welcome Father Jacques to this talk. Thank you so much, John. I want to share my PowerPoint with you. I think it is okay now. Yes, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to share with you um, the history of Congo, I can say, the deal, the deal about Congo and Canada, yes, because I can say that Congo is um, one of the most richest country in the, in the world, but also most of the poorest country in terms of uh, natural resources. We have all critical mineral, minerals for energy transition but also we are facing huge impact of these kind of minerals in our country. So for me, this is very important to share with you some input is our history, is um, a tragedy. I want to share with you just a tragedy of Congo now, yes. So I want to share impact of critical minerals for green and clean technologies in Congo uh, about the green justice. Uh, for me, solidarity is very important, yes. Solidarity is, is fundamental, fundamental is a fundamental value, value of uh, humankind. It is human, cosmic and divine solidarity. It unifies the human and the divine, the cosmic and the real, the invisible and the visible, but also the solidarity reminds us that we are all made of the same cloth with our fragilities and contingencies running through us. In the same way, our universe, our planet, with all its biodiversity, is also made of the same fragilities. Therefore, our strengthen them comes from our capacity to mutually support our human, cosmic and divine maturation as individuals, but also as community. So for me, the, the concept of um, solidarity was very, very um, important for me. As Congolese, we are suffering a lot and we need this solidarity. And the Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti said that all of us, we are friends, we are brothers and sisters. How can we support ourselves? And this sharing for me is very important to share with you what Congolese people are suffering about money. So solidarity is the ability to be touched and to be challenged by fragility 
and suffering of others people. For the suffering of our planet, the universe and the all biodiversity in order to support them. But this solarity takes on its full meaning in the context of uh, poorest, the context of uh, people who are very exploited now, the context of uh, vulnerable people. So those who are abusing in Congo, human rights abuse, children violation, women violations, they're very vulnerable people. So they need our solidarity. In a world where the strongest tend to let down the weakest, in a world where the richest tend to get richer on the backs of the poor, in a world where new form of slavery and abuse against children and women and the vulnerable are still flourishing, in a world where our common home planet and its resources are being overexploited, it is worth reflecting on the updating of solidarity. So tonight, we attempt to uncover this forgotten solidarity from a mining justice perspective, based on mining in the DRC and its impact on global green and clean energy technologies and all the value, value chains. I have just, uh, uh, I can say a simple question. I want to answer uh, a simple question. How and in what way does mining for batteries for electric cars, for solar panel, for wind turbines, for semiconductors, for robots, precision mis missiles, space exploration, in short, for our social welfare and Western security cause serious human, socioeconomic, cultural, environmental, and ecological injustices to the Congolese local communities? This is my question. So, as we are moving uh, to green, transition to green technologies. So we need more and more minerals. This is my problem. So climate change is a huge challenge for all of us, our humanity. So we need transition from fossil fuel to clean technologies, clean energy. But how are we doing this? At the same time, we need also green technologies to support our transition. You can see here, all I can say, all strategic technologies, batteries, fuel cell, wind, traction motors, Robotics, drones, IT, they are very important for our social and security welfare here in Canada and across the world. So minerals problems is a huge problem, not only for mining companies, but also for our way of living. So we need also conversion. 
we the people, because we are final users of this kind of technologies. So we need conversions. Not only money companies, but also the people who have to change our way of living. Because they are giving to us like consumers. But the issue here is the transition. How can we move from fossil fuel to green, to clean energy? We need green or clean technologies. But how can we, how are we getting green technologies? Green technologies need a huge amount of minerals. This is the problem of Congo. Because of the race of global north and China economies to secure the supply chains of cobalt, copper, lithium, of coltan for robotics, for fuel cell, for winds, Congolese are dying. It's our problem. So from 1994 up today, 10 millions of Congolese have died because of the control of strategic or critical minerals. This is our story. As can you see here, Congo is plenty of minerals. So our history is the, is, is the drama of minerals since before our independence till today. And as a Jesuit, I decide to study mining, uh, minerals, mining, economy, politics, to know how can we, how can I contribute to the peace, for peace in my country? I came to minerals, to mining, because of the peace, lack of peace and justice in my country. And the UN, United Nations published four reports saying that the control of strategic minerals is the root of the conflicts in Congo. Now, in Congo, we have more than 200 rebel groups in the eastern of Congo. All of them are taking advantage of minerals. But the coltan, the cobalt, the gold, we here in Canada, in global north, we have the final uses of these kind of products. It can be directly or indirectly through our dishwashers, through our robotics, through our solar panel, through our missiles for our defense. As you know, all the precision miss missiles, they have semiconductor. They have semiconductors. And in Congo, we produce germanium for semiconductors. So now Taiwan is known, yeah, Taiwan, they have made semiconductors, but you need minerals for semiconductors. You need germanium and gallium for this. And there are now two Canadian mining companies, Kiko, Ivanova, and Lubumbashi. They are operating in Germanium and Gallium, in Zen, in Congo. So uh, this is our history in Congo. But the mining extraction in Congo have 
a huge impact on uh, climate change, land use, water management, waste, governance, health, safety, and human rights. That's a problem. You can say that Congolese are not taking advantage of this kind of uh, extraction, extractivism, yes, in Congo. So um, the climate change is very challenging for our, our global, but mining companies have a huge impact in Congo. Mining in the DRC takes place both in industry and artisanal forms. Both forms of exploitation have very negative impact on local communities and countries. The first negative impact is the reality of conflict minerals in Congo. As I was saying, more than 10 million people have died, have died as a, as a result for the control of rich means, mines, multinationals, automotive, digital and arms companies are financing wars directly or indirectly in Congo. Another consequence is the work of uh, vulnerable people. You can see here, women are working in the cobalt and copper artisanal activities. Before I came to Canada, I was working in Lubumbashi in the Jesuit center named Cav Santa Rupe. So I was on ground working with these women to protect them because the water is very, very polluting. It's toxic, this water. Because all, I can say in the south of Congo, our copper, cobalt, they have a huge amount of uranium. So when women are working there, there are serious health problem for our mothers, for our children there. So I was working with them to protect, to accompany them. It's a huge issue for us in Congo. Because of the poverty, people are obliged to go for artisanal mining. And they will sell the cobalt to mining companies. And many companies will finally sell here. So there is a link. There's a link between all of these kinds of things. And it's the same. I am here with them. So I was in the ground. Here I am in the Glencore compounds, near Glencore. And last August, I went to Sudbury to visit Sudbury. I was very happy to see the Green program with uh, Professor Dr. Beck. And also I went to see Big Nickel. And I went to see uh, also uh, um, Glencore. I asked to them, why are you doing things here differently than in Congo? It's the same multinational here in Canada in Salisbury, but in Congo, it's not the same. I can say, you can see how people are suffering uh, in Congo. Another impact is the child labor. Here, I was asking to the children, I was doing my best how to get them out of this kind of things. The place of children is in the school, not in the mining. And this is not acceptable. 
for our cell phone, for our electric cars, for our batteries, we are exporting children upstream. So what we need is solidarity, not only downstream, but also in the all value chains of batteries and green technologies. You can see children, families, unacceptable. This is our history, our story. So it's the same. Soldiers are controlling minerals there. So what we need is solidarity because Canada is, I can say, a, a huge platform for money around the world. So there is a link between Canada and Congo because uh, Canadian mining companies are the first who came in Congo in 1993. I can say like London, Banro, uh, yeah, first quantum, barrick, they are there in Congo. So 30% of mining companies in Congo are from Canada. And 70% uh, and 50% are from China. But Chinese bought the asset from Canada and the US. And now the US and Canadian. They want to go back again because of the race of uh, Coltan, the race of, uh, of Cobalt. So Congo now is suffering the race between global north and China in Congo for the control of minerals. So I can say that um, uh, this issue is very big, not only for money companies, because uh, Canadian mining activities in, here in Canada, is about four percent of Canada Canada GDP. So our richest here, our welfare, like Canadians, four percent comes from mining activities. And Toronto Stock Exchange is, I can say the huge platform in the world of financing, exploration and uh, extraction of minerals in Congo, in the world also. And I can say 70% of uh, Congolese mining companies, they raise funds here in Canada. That's why I came here also to study in Canada, to know how can I do my advocacy here in Canada, yes. So, what we need is just due diligence. We can support due diligence here in Canada, and it can have a huge impact in my country in Congo. But what we need is not just due diligence, and uh, uh, because most of the due diligence are voluntary, and the Congo in the Congo, we have now. 15 years of experience of uh, implementing due diligence in mining, because Congo is like a, a lab of all international initiatives. But there is no change because of voluntary aspect of due diligence. What we need now is mandatory, mandatory compliance, and environmental, social, and governance compliance. So, I mean, uh, for me, governing the transition is like governing the cacophony. Yes, we have a huge interest, and what we need is just mandatory because voluntary. Uh, due diligence that doesn't work, that doesn't work. So uh, I can conclude that saying that a maximum of mandatory rules is desirable in terms of 
ESG and compliance for all value chains of transistor technologies, not only for downstream here, but also in upstream. And what we need also in Congo is access to justice, like uh, uh, the German uh, um, due diligence, they allowed uh, some who are working outside of uh, Germany, they can have uh, the place for access to justice in Germany. And I mean, in Canada also, what you are doing in Caritas, in Kairos and students and the work of uh, John is very important for us in the South. So we can know a lot about Canadian rules and then we can prepare the people in Congo how to get access to the justice here in Canada. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father Jacques. That was very, very helpful and very, very interesting. Um, I, I just wanted to say that one of the companies I've been following in Canada is electric battery materials in cobalt, which is processing ore from the Congo and just received a $51 million grant from the federal government under the critical mineral strategy. It's on the territory of the Tamag, uh, the um, Temiskaming First Nation, and had, they were never um, able to get involved in, in the project. So thank you very, very much. Um, we have some time now for questions, to answer some questions from people. And if you had questions in the chat, I think, uh, Johannes, you were going to provide us with some, uh, some feedback sure. from it. Sure. Um, so the first question that I saw was asked by Stanley Lee, um, who asks, how much influence is there from the global north and China remining and other energy projects? And I think Father Jack addressed some of that, but if anyone... I think, I else, think that was answered. Okay, sure. Uh, so I'll ask uh, the second question by Carrie Richards was, are there any examples anywhere of a responsible mining operation as stewards of the land and a respecter of community, is there any models to replicate or is all mining impossible to exist anywhere? The implications of no mining shut down the green revolution requiring copper, silver, nickel, et cetera, for electrical transmission. Are there books on the transformation of the mining industry? So yeah, number of questions. I can repost that in the chat. Okay. But, yeah. um, maybe I could just take a little bit of a run at that one. And that is that most of the kind of changes that are needed are actually changed to much bigger to other systems. For example, if we're going to go with critical, critical minerals, um, a lot of what they're calling critical minerals are needed for the cars and arms and the space race, as Father Jacques pointed out. Um, if we were to change how we did those things, and instead of looking at lots of new cars, looked at public transit, if we were to look at stopping the space race and probably having less arms, we'd be in a much better position. I don't know if one of the other panelists wants to take a quick stab at that one. No, we'll go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. So the next question comes from Stephanie uh, Stringer. Um, and it says Father Jacques uh, may be about to answer this, uh, but if not, in addition to regulation, due diligence, etc., it seems to me that recycling and reclaiming minerals and metals is absolutely vital. In theory, it is possible to recycle metals more or less indefinitely, but often they are just thrown away. I wonder what the panelists' thoughts are on this subject and whether there are any campaigns working on it. Father Jacques, do you have, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the question is very, <laughs> very complex for me uh, because um, uh, before going to to recycle, uh, recycling, you have to produce first. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, Uh, I'm not convinced that we can do the transition with minerals. This, 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 I can, my, my response is also, my answer is also for, uh, for the first question uh, regarding 
money responsible operation operation in the world. I mean, um, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure that we can do the transition. We can do uh, clean technologies with minerals unless we change the technologies of extraction and unless we change the respect of the land of the and the people this is cost a lot for mining companies so i can say that um uh, the more the mining operation is cheaper, the most our welfare is very good. And when mining operation is cheaper, like in Congo, with no respect of environmental, no respect of the people, we cannot support anymore this kind of transition. Thank you. I, I, Father Dario has his hand up, so we'll take him next. Father Dario. Uh, thank you, Jax, and thank you, John, for, and thank you to, to the questions. For sure, John has a very, many, very good experience about that, so she could uh, explain about her book with very many answers to all of this. But uh, I also want to, to add something. In the same uh, line of Jax, I don't know really uh, any responsible mining operation. Um, Yes, there are some efforts from efforts from the companies to spare water in some place to apply new technology in another. But it is very true that, as Jack said, that uh, they apply the, uh, different um, way of uh, of doing uh, according to the states where they are. So uh, if there are stricter laws, they respect, and where they are not uh, monitored, monitored, they don't respect. So I, I, I'm not. Mm, uh, very uh, supporting responsible mining operation. I don't, I don't believe about that. Anyway, we, we are uh, asking for mitigation. We are asking for integral reparation. And we are also asking always for prevention. No mining zone in some uh, cases. The right to say no by some communities. And uh, I think that transition could happen from uncontrolled mining operation with a rhythm regulated just from the by the financial interests to the essential mining. Yeah? And uh, just one word about uh, reuse and recycle. Yes, I think that uh, politics have to support this kind of economy and they are supporting just extraction. So we have to decide in which way politics could um, pass uh, forward in, uh, to economy. But uh, we also, and uh, I finish here, defend that some kind of extraction have to be strongly reduced. For example, gold. Uh, mm -hmm. The most of the gold is taken from a hole and is put in another hole of the banks. Uh, it, it is very uh, incredible. Uh, uh, we, we don't understand this kind of money. So there are some kind of minerals that we have really to, to ban them. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really good point. Um, that would, in my mind, include coal, uranium, and uh, and gold for sure. Most gold goes into the banks and into jewelry. It's not used for anything else. Um, as other questions? Yeah, so I'll combine two. Dean asks, what are some similarities between the mining challenges for each of the areas discussed by our speakers, like in Brazil, Canada, and the DRC? And then I think a related question by Bridget, how Kairos can help uh, Congolese people? Uh, there is emergency to help and ask Canada, China, US, France to stop their deal. I think it's asking about solidarity actions that other countries can take. So if anyone has answers to that. Somebody want to respond to that? Anybody? I Yeah, how um, Kairos can help the Global South. Uh, in case of the Congo, I mean, um, for me, the most important thing can be um, to support those who are documenting uh, human rights abuse in uh, in um, 
in mining operations, in mining zones, and how can them also um, be very, very effective? How can them uh, raise awareness in Congo and also outside of Congo here in Canada? And because directly it's very difficult for them, but they need, we need collaboration uh, between um, global north NGOs and south, global south NGOs, and then we can um, work together. For me, um, the, the, I can say the sharing of knowledge, investigation, how to, to, to do investigation together, uh, case studies together is very important for me than money. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to just say that, um, it, that getting control of the discourse, which I think both Jacques and, and Father Jacques and Father Dario referred to, is really important because here we follow, we swallow so many of the myths of mining, the critical mineral strategies being the latest offensive from the industry. Um, the global south exists within the global north, as Loretta pointed out. There's within for indigenous people in this country, many of the same issues are true and have been true in the past. And we need to be able to recognize that that, that happens. Um, I think we've got, well, I think actually uh, Kairos was, and uh, Development and Peace were going to talk and Student Christian Movement had a few things they wanted to let you know about actions that were going to be taken in the next few, the next few weeks. Um, can somebody, is Shannon, are you speaking to that or, or Ioannis or Dean? Yeah, I'll speak to it at the at the very end. We have maybe we're a couple at the, we're at the end. We're at five minutes, 20. We've got five minutes left. So great. Thanks, Joan. Let me just share my screen here. There are a few slides. Uh, the first one, just a reminder about Joan's book and an opportunity to to say thank you so much uh, to Joan for providing a, a really rich text that motivated us who participated in this reading group to want to learn more. So this is the, the roots of the webinar tonight and just encourage you to find that resource. Um, and we should say thanks to, to uh, the other folks who've helped us out. Canadian Jesuits International uh, were really useful and, and contributed a lot and helped us connect with Father Jacques. Uh, the Diocesan Council in Toronto for Development and Peace uh, contributed to this webinar too. So lots and lots of folks, which is such a great testament to building those relationships of solidarity. Uh, a few things that we can do, some next steps. Uh, if you're wondering, here are some uh, specific mining ones coming up. Sunday, March 5th, there will be a virtual prayer gathering uh, organized by the Toronto Diocesan Council of Development and Peace. It will be a Hope for Mining Justice prayer gathering for about a half an hour at 7 p.m. Uh, there will be some links in the chat and also in a, a follow-up email. So I encourage you to register for that and come participate. It is on the 5th because March 5 through 8th is the Prospectors and Development Association of Canada Convention, which is one of the biggest mining conventions in the world. It happens every year here in Toronto. So look at your email uh, for also more information about where to act locally in Toronto, but also ways to participate digitally. There's lots of activists who organize plenty of things around the PDAC every year. And we'll send out some information too to folks who are registered on this webinar. There are three bills that we'd like to mention, um, two of which Dario and um, Father Jacques gestured toward when talking about due diligence. Bill C-262 and 263, both are related to due diligence in some different ways. They are explained in greater detail on the Kairos website. Uh, Development and Peace and Kairos both have been working with others in the Canadian Network on Corporate Accountability to urge these kinds of bills and legislation to be passed, and the Student Christian Movement has been a, a big help there as well. And the other bill would address environmental racism, which has quite a lot to do with issues of waste and mining and many other things we've talked about on the webinar too, so the three kind of go together, so you can learn more legislatively that way. 
And lastly, there are two more events that are in the nearer future, not maybe as directly related, but uh, still related in the way that all these justice issues are related. Uh, the first is on February 22nd, right around the corner. Kairos is hosting another webinar, Voices of Resistance, a Celebration of Black History and Imagining Futures. And there will again be registration information in the chat. And then on February 25th, just a couple days later, there is another virtual webinar that is the campaign launch for Development and Pieces campaign this year, Stand for the Land, which has a lot to do with land defense and issues of land um, and would really invite all of you to come to those. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. Um, I want to take this moment to uh, really thank our panelists, uh, Father Dario and Father Schauk and Loretta Williams for sharing their stories with us and for their commitment and passion and their struggle as land defenders. And to thank um, the sponsoring organizations of this webinar for the opportunity to get this information out there.